Hello, I'm Paul Richards with the latest from Science. The Australian Government says physical distancing is clearly helping to minimise new infections of COVID-19. So much so that modelling from the Doherty Institute reveals we're on track to eliminate the virus from mainland Australia, but only if those tough restrictions remain in place. Joining me now to talk about that and other developments is Professor Rainer McIntyre from UNSW's Kirby Institute. Rainer, welcome back to the show. Hello. So according to this model, every 10 people infected currently spread the virus to five more people on average. The Doherty team says that at that level, the virus would be unable to circulate and would die out within Australia. How much hope can we take from that? So I think they're just um, explaining what's happened with the flattening of the curve. And we've seen um, a peak in disease in about late March and then a decline in cases, uh, which fits very much with the travel bans, actually, not the social distancing. We had some rolling travel bans implemented between March the 5th and the 10th, and we would expect to see those effects um, from uh, around the middle of March to about the 10th of April, which is exactly what we saw. And it also fits with the fact that more than 60% of the cases we were seeing were um, travel imported. So what we aim to do with disease control measures is to reduce the reproductive number, or R0, below 1. Um, and that's what the 10 cases giving rise to five new cases indicates, that the reproductive number is below one. So one case can't give rise to more than one case. Um, and if that's the case, then, you know, like New Zealand, we should be aiming for elimination. Now, in terms of infectious diseases, elimination doesn't mean you get rid of the disease altogether. It means that you stop transmission within the local community and you may still get imported cases. And a great example is measles. Australia has achieved elimination of measles, according to the WHO, but we still see outbreaks of measles, but they are related to importation from travel and they die out. They, they cannot be sustained and they don't take off in the whole community. The one caveat around COVID-19, I guess, is that our testing criteria still don't allow testing of asymptomatic people at high risk, like family contacts who are, or um, people in a nursing home where there's an outbreak or another closed setting where there's an outbreak. Uh, we've also got probably some transmission events around the Ruby Princess event. Um, and the nature of the infection is such that 80% of people have mild infections. So you've got to have growth of the epidemic to a substantial degree before you realise that transmission is happening. And I think that if we can see a, a decline, a continued decline of the numbers remaining down in the next couple of weeks, we can be pretty um, hopeful that we could achieve elimination. However, we can't really achieve elimination keeping the schools open. It's, uh, you know, from an epidemiologic point of view, you can't separate out one population from another, particularly as children live with adults. Um, and high school kids could have parents in their 40s, 50s, or even 60s, so definitely in the risk age group. Um, the, the likelihood is that children are getting infected and they are transmitting it quite efficiently, but they're not getting sick, or very few of them are getting sick. That means that they can still spread the infection, so any elimination goal must be accompanied by closure of schools. That's a really interesting point, and I guess a, a key difference in your opinion to, to what um, the advice is that, that is being um, uh, put forward by the government. The government, as you know, has left it up to the states essentially to set their own policies here, but it's made clear that it, it believes that it's safe to send kids back to school. So um, what is your view there, just to clarify your last point? So I think there's a lot of unknowns. We don't actually have good data. I understand there's some um, blood test serological surveys that are planned in school-age children to try and understand how much transmission there is, but we don't have the data. So um, there's a bit of risk in um, making assumptions when we don't have the data. With every other respiratory transmissible infectious diseases, we know that they spread most intensely in children, young people, and young adults. So it, uh, I would expect that it wouldn't be very different in this case. We do know that children are less likely to get symptomatic illness, but they are probably just as likely to get infected and to be the vectors of silent transmission in the community. 
So we know that restrictions are going to remain in place for four more weeks. That's what was clarified by the government uh, uh, yesterday. There are some mixed reactions to that on our social channels. Let me read you one. 50 new cases a day, and yet, yet we still have to endure another month of lockdowns. Totally unreasonable. Reiner, is it unreasonable? No, it's not unreasonable at all. It's very sensible because the this infection has a long incubation period, so it's up to two weeks. That means that the effect of interventions and being sure that they're successful takes that long or double that long. So we need to wait two to four weeks to really be sure that the trends we're seeing are going to continue. Um, so it's a precautionary principle, and I think that's quite reasonable. Okay. Catherine Amos asks, why can't we just isolate the vulnerable? Uh, that's just not how our society works. You know, you can't just uh, lock up old people and put little kids in a bubble unless we want to, you know, take all the children and put them in a camp somewhere on their own. Uh, you know, children live with adults. They live in families. They sometimes have grandparents in the home. And... Um, the most intense transmission happens in the household. So we saw that data come from China, that over 70% of all the infections arose inside the household. So if you're allowing kids to mix in thousands in some cases, um, they could be bringing infection back home into the family, which is the highest risk of transmission. There's a lot of talk at the moment about a phone app that the government will soon be asking Australians to voluntarily download. It's aimed at increasing surveillance of those infected. There are clearly privacy implications, but why would an app like this be useful? The use of apps is a really good idea and it's been used successfully in a number of Asian countries, including Singapore. And I think the Australian government is looking at modifying that Singapore app for Australia. So you do have to relinquish some privacy in the sense that you've got to keep your Bluetooth on, you've got to get the messages, you've got to send data about yourself and where you've been or that, you know, that data is taken and received. But it also means that if you're in a community hotspot somewhere where there's been an outbreak, you can get a notification saying, you know, we note that you were at, you know, this particular shopping centre on this particular day, you could be at risk if you develop symptoms, contact us. So especially when epidemics get very large in size, which is not the case here yet at this stage, but somewhere, you know, where um, the human resources capability to do contact tracing has been exhausted, the use of an app can allow you to continue to do that contact tracing um, despite lack of human resources and that's a situation we've seen in many countries around the world. So what's your message to people who might be saying look I just can't get past handing over my location data to the government um, what's the benefit of an app like this uh, does that outweigh it in your view? So I think in public health epidemics in, in a crisis like this um, we need to make do some things that are in the greater good and uh, they're in our personal good as well because um, the benefits personally are that you will get information if you've been in a place that's high risk where there's been an outbreak, if you've potentially been in contact with somebody who's infected um, and you can also get information on general areas where there might be outbreaks um, and of course the benefit for the health authorities is that they can get a more complete picture of contacts and contacts are the contacts of people who are infected are the way that epidemics grow. If you don't identify everybody who's a contact, then you get silent transmission and the epidemic grows. So it's it's one of the main pillars of um, eliminate an elimination strategy. And it actually goes towards our way sort of forward or, or if you like, out of this crisis because the modelling is only as good as the data and this is providing data that, that um, helps inform what the next step should be in this crisis. Yes, that's true. Um, the use of those apps will also provide a lot of good data that um, will help in terms of disease control efforts. Now, you're a biosecurity expert, Rhino. We've obviously made good progress here in Australia, but how concerned should we be about developing countries? A lot of these places don't have the same level of testing. Can we be expecting a new surge in some parts of the world? Yes, definitely. It's what we've seen already, right? You know, in, in the early February, middle of February, we were all sitting around just watching what was happening in China, thinking that looks pretty remote. It doesn't really affect us. Um, and then, you know, whilst China was getting things under control towards the end of February, it's all of a sudden it started to surge in 
countries like South Korea and Italy and Iran. Um, and then we started getting imported cases from those countries. Um, and uh, we started to see a huge surge in travel-related cases. And the epidemic has taken off at different times in different countries. With countries in um, low-income countries, the risk is if there's weak diagnostic capacity and poor surveillance capacity, there may not be detection of the epidemic at all. Um, and that's certainly a concern in some of our neighboring countries in Asia and, uh, you know, the other very large country, India, um, which, you know, has reported a very small number of cases for their population size. Uh, what's happening in the urban slums in, in India, you know, which have been put into lockdown when there's one case there. Um, it, I think uh, the, the, there's a big unknown. Now, the big question for everyone at the moment is how is the hunt for a vaccine going? We see in the news various developments of, um, of trials that are, that are underway. But can you put into context the reality of, of what that means and, and how the hunt's actually going? Yeah, so coronavirus is not the easiest virus to make a vaccine against. Something like measles is the ideal virus to make a vaccine against because exposure to the virus or to antigens on the surface of the virus will give you long-lasting, lifelong immunity, high levels of immunity. So you get your measles shot, you're generally protected for life. Um, that's not the case with coronaviruses. The um, immunity is not long-lasting. It's certainly not lifelong for any of the seasonal coronaviruses or the um, uh, SARS and MERS coronavirus. What we know from studies of those viruses is that you can get reinfected and um, you can uh, the antibodies that give you the protection last somewhere between 16 months to three years, maybe six years at the most. So we're looking at a vaccine that probably will, we will need some kind of booster dose um, or ongoing vaccination, maybe in the way we vaccinate against flu. I'm quite hopeful that we'll have a vaccine in a reasonable time frame, and that's because of the scope and the scale of the efforts. I mean, there are so many groups all over the world of top scientists who are putting their minds and their hearts towards finding a vaccine, um, inclu including groups in Australia, but everywhere else. And we've seen something unprecedented happen is that um, two vaccine manufacturing giants, Sanofi and GSK, have actually joined forces, um, which has never happened before in, in my lifetime of working in vaccines for 30 years. Never seen that happen before. So that is gives me a lot of hope that there's really um, a very, very strong and concerted and coordinated effort globally um, to get some solutions. That is encouraging. Um, now, separate to that, there are about 300 trials underway around the world into potential treatments. Have we seen any game changes yet? Um, we haven't seen game changes yet, but there's a lot of promising drugs. The um, approach to drugs for COVID-19 has been that we take drugs that are already existing for some other indication and we repurpose them. That makes it much faster than starting from scratch and developing a brand new drug because that, that will take years. So this way, um, the approach that's been taken will probably enable us to have drug treatments before we have a vaccine. And that can also make quite a big difference um, to disease control. Um, so things like remdesivir, which is a drug that was designed for treatment of Ebola, um, is looking quite promising. Um, course, we've heard a lot about hydroxychloroquine, which has an immune modulating effect. And uh, we have to really await the randomized control clinical trials to see whether there is any efficacy. Um, there's other, other, so there's, there's drugs that are um, looked at for their antiviral um, properties or for their immunomodulation properties. And of the antivirals, we've seen one trial published of the HIV protease inhibitors, ritonavir and lopinavir, which are used together. And that unfortunately did not show any benefit. And um, from listening to clinicians on a couple of webinars that I've been on, uh, clinicians from highly affected countries um, have been saying that clinically they, did, they, they weren't seeing a benefit of those drugs. They also, I also noticed that, and this is not evidence-based, it's just anecdote, but I've also heard the same clinicians say that azithromycin, which is an antibiotic that's also used in combination with chloroquine sometimes, um, uh, they, they didn't feel it's got much benefit. But in the end, we have to wait for the randomised control clinical trials. That's the only way to prove 
that something has genuine efficacy in reducing the side effect complications of disease or outcomes of the illness. And, and what sort of period of time do those sorts of trials take to be completed? Well, normally um, you've got to first do, uh, generally the process is, first of all, you do laboratory and in vitro studies looking at the effect of the drugs on cells. Then you might do animal studies. And then you move to human safety studies to look at side effects and toxicity, which is really important. Uh, so hydroxychloroquine, for example, has quite substantial cardiac toxicity. And then you move to clinical efficacy trials. So that's called phase one, phase two, and phase three trials. And it's those phase three trials that give us the final answer on whether one drug gives you a survival benefit compared to another. And how long, no, is there a normal length of time? Like what, what sort of time period are we looking at for some of these treatments perhaps to come online, be, be made available on a, on a larger scale? I think we might see certain drugs within a month. I'm hearing that there's um, clinical trials that will be published perhaps this month in April or next month in May. So once those trials are published, because these are drugs that are already existing, that have just been repurposed, the pathway to approval and getting it out into practice will be much shorter. All right, Professor Rhona McIntyre, thanks again. It's a pleasure. I'll be back on Monday with Professor Peter Doherty. And a reminder that if you're looking for specific COVID content, we now have a rich library of videos and articles. Just head to our website. Enjoy your weekend at home, and I'll see you again on Monday. Mm -hmm.